everyone. Welcome to Your Money Map, sponsored by the Alliance for Lifetime Income. Very glad to have you along with me today. Just a reminder, as always, we like this to be an inclusive conversation. So if you want to chime in, if you have a question, if you have a comment, you can just do it in the comment section. We welcome all the people who are joining us on Facebook and on LinkedIn as well. Um, I wanted to start this conversation with a question. And the question is, is it time to retire the word retire? My guest today, I think, would say an absolute yes to that. Uh, his name is Michael Clinton. He is, uh, full disclosure, a very good friend of mine. He's also a best-selling author, a longevity expert, a thought leader. Um, for many, many years, he was the president and the publishing director at Hearst Magazines. He now writes a column for Esquire. He's a writer at large and is also a columnist for Men's Health. And if you ask us nicely, we'll tell you about the marathon that we once once ran together, although he ran it much faster than I did. Michael, welcome. Thank you so much for, for being here today and, and for joining me for this conversation. Jean, thank you. It's always great to be with you. And uh, I hope your running is still up to speed. You're pretty fast. I don't know. You did a great job uh, in running that Philadelphia Marathon. So I, I loved running it with you. So great to see you. It was. It's great to see you too. I, I think that you are um, not just the author of the book, Roar. I think you're the poster child for the book, Roar. ROAR is an acronym, and you talk about roaring into the second half of life. Can you tell us what it is? What does it stand for? Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, you know, the, the, what we used to think about in the script that we were given is that in the second half of life, we were supposed to wind down. We were supposed to sort of have this long wind down. And, you know, I had this epiphany when I was stepping out of the day-to-day -day at first, that I wanted to wind up in so many ways, and I knew so many people who wanted to wind up. So I wanted to put a spotlight around this. And so ROAR is an acronym. It's, it's sort of a, a, a process, a philosophy, an approach to life that is giving you a very dynamic second half. So you know, each of the letters represents something. The chapters are fun and informative. And if you want, I can walk you through the acronym in terms of what, what each one represents. Uh, the, the first R, thank you. The first R is, you know, this notion of how do we integrate reimagining our lives the same way we integrate nutrition or wellness or fitness or our own discipline around money and savings. You know, we have disciplines in our lives that are integrated in, you know, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. How do we now integrate this notion of reimagining ourselves, especially in the second half, is an ongoing process. And we walked through different tools and approaches, and we interviewed 40 people in the book who have all done this. And so there, there are people who have completely pivoted in different ways. The O uh, of, of Roar is before you can move forward in any part of life, you have to own where you are today. So you have to own your, your, to own your health and your health numbers. Mm -hmm. You have to own your finances and your financial numbers. You know, here's the thing. If you're 60 and healthy today, you'll more than likely live to be 90. So are you financially equipped to live to 90? And if not, what are you doing about it now at 40 or 45 or 50? Because you still have a long run ahead of you. I like to say own your age. You know, I hate 60 is the new 60. I think, you know, I hate 60 is the new 40. Excuse me. It should be 60 is the new 60. Um, and own that you're going to have an end date. So we all are going to have an end date. And what are we going to do about that in terms of planning our lives? The A is the action plan after you've done all of that. And one of my favorite parts of the book is something called life layering, which we can get into. And then mm -hmm. the final R is reassess your relationships, which because the people around you are the ones who are gonna help you facilitate a different kind of second half than maybe the script you were handed. So four parts, pretty simple acronym, great inspirational stories, great tips, great fun quizzes, great things to do just to sort of set, set the tone for that, that approach. 
Yeah, yeah, it's a great book, and and there's a reason why it it keeps going into successive printings. I, I know a lot of people who are getting a lot from it. So if you're all watching, you should you should definitely go ahead and and pick up a copy. I, I was struck by your description of the the differences between the first half of life and the second half of life, and you you talk about when you're in your linear career. How, how is the second half of life different? Well, you know, for those of us who are boomers, um, we were sort of came to age that we were going to have a linear career. We we're going to have a 40 year career. We we're going to, you know, climb the, the ladder, so to speak. We we're going to be in an industry or a company. And the way it was constructed is that you would do that for 40 years and then you would kind of, quote, retire. And we can get into that toxic word. I like the word rewire. And I love what Serena Williams said yesterday as she was announcing leaving tennis. She talked about retirement as really being an obsolete word in so many, mm -hmm. so many ways. Um, but, you know, what's happened now is, as you know, the Stanford University Center for Longevity just came out with a study called the New Map of Life. And that will mean a 60 year career for those younger professionals today who are gonna live and work a lot longer. And so they're not thinking about linear careers. They're thinking about a 20 year career in one area, another 20 year career in another area, maybe a third career. With longevity and long life, there's the opportunity to have many different careers if we choose them. And most of the people I interviewed in the book were all over 45, they all, many of them had made major decisions about new careers. A 53 year old woman who was a writer and editor who decided to become a medical doctor at 53. And she talks about her journey and her story. So I think this notion of linear thinking about what we do for work is changing dramatically and will continue to change and open up the possibilities of a second or third career post 50. Yeah, I, th I thought her story was was remarkable, in part because you would think that med schools wouldn't even take you, right? A, a years, yeah. years ago, they wouldn't take you in right. your 50s. And now the fact that they're willing to to open up their doors. My, my dad, who died far too young, always talked about the fact that he was going to go to law school after he right. stopped his career, right? He didn't, didn't have the opportunity to do that. But I think had he lived, he absolutely would have and he would have been been terrific at it the the o part as as you might have guessed is is very intriguing to me i think i think we all have to assess continually along the way in part um because of our health but also because of our money to figure out if we are in fact on track if we have set ourselves up in a way to afford to make these changes and to make these um, leaps into, into new and, and unexplored places. How, how did the people that you talked to set themselves up for that? The biggest question that comes up always is, well, you know, I don't have time and I don't have the money. You know, I would like to go back to school. I would like to learn something new. I would like to pivot into a new career. There were lots of ways that people who we inter that I interviewed found the money, you know, especially um, there are scholarships. Scholarshipowl.com is a great resource. Uh, many of them. One woman actually sold her house to actually fund the ability to go back to school and get a to get a graduate degree to become a psychologist to work in the drug and rehab counseling world. She had been a journalist prior, and so she in her late fifties made that decision. There are many states, depending on where you live, that if you're 60 or older, you can go to college for free, or if you have a certain level of, so, of, of economic income, you can go to college for free. So every state, you know, has a lot of different things. But there are a lot. There's a lot of money out there to get reskilled and retooled. And by the way, you can also go to MOOCs. You mm -hmm. people are familiar with massive, mass open online courses. And there were many people who went. And became farm techs, and you know took different courses and certificates. So, there, you know, it's part of it's being innovative and creative, and knowing there's money out there to do to do it. When we started this conversation, I, I mentioned that I, I was pretty sure you don't like the word 
retirement. What is it about it that you think is so toxic? What is it, what is it about it that you think is holding people back? Yeah, well, as we all know, retirement is an artificial construct, right? It was created in the 1930s by the government. And basically prior to that, pe people worked until they died. Now, the, the difference was the life expectancies were much lower. So in the early 30s, 62 was the life expectancy. And so you, when you did work, you know, and you, quote, retired and you got Social Security and you sort of, quote, lived the good life, you did that for a couple of years and then you did die. You know, th there were always rarities. But today, you know, you're going to once again, if you're 60 or 65 and you, quote, retire, people enter it oftentimes without realizing that they're gonna live another 25 or 30 years. And the retirement formula is obsolete. It is outdated, it needs to be disrupted. It's, it's not sustainable as a way to live. People wanna be involved, engaged, have a purpose. And so we use the word rewire or refire to pivot into that second half of, of a different kind of life. And so I think we've got to banish words like retire. And you know, by the way, let's banish a few other words too, like age appropriate and you know midlife oh, crisis. Oh yes, please. <laughs> yeah, let's call it let's call it person appropriate. You know, because you might decide to become a parent at fifty or go back to school at sixty. You know, I went back to Columbia University to get a master's degree in my sixties, and you know, if I had had this self-imposed restriction that I was you know, too old to learn something, I wouldn't have done it. And it was a, it was a great, it was a great experience. So we put a lot of um, boxes around ourselves because of this notion of what we think retirement is supposed to be when in fact it can be a whole new blossoming of a new part of your life moving forward. So I know there are probably people who are watching and let me just mention once again, I'm talking with Michael Clinton. He is the author of ROAR, R-O-A-R, Into the Second Half of Life. Um, if you've got questions or you've got comments, we welcome you in this conversation. Just type them in the chat and I'll, I'll pull them into the dialogue that, that Michael and I are having. So. I think it's it's uh, I mean it's fabulous that you knew that you wanted to go to Columbia to get your master's. It's amazing that um, that Stephanie, the woman in your book, knew that she wanted to become a doctor. Uh, there are many people who, having done the same thing or some version of the same thing for decades, don't have any idea what they want right. to do. They they are feeling um, they're feeling stuck. How yeah. can you get yourself unstuck? Yeah, no, I, I get that question a lot as I'm out talking to groups and doing the book tour and doing speeches and so forth. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a question that comes up a lot. And there are a couple of answers that um, we, we talk about in the book. One of them is go back to your younger self. What is it that you left on the shelf when you were in your 20s and you really... We all know the story of the person who wanted to be the anthropologist and mom or dad talked that person into being an accountant. Nothing wrong with being an accountant because it's a good job and a well-paying job and a, an important profession. But your heart was really in being, in being an anthropologist. So how do you pick up that thread and re-engage in, in midlife? So I'll give you a great story. A, a woman who was a sales and marketing executive she was a mother with two kids and married and was a had a robust sales and marketing career, but she had always wanted to be a mystery writer. That was always her dream from her early 20s. And finally, in her 50s, she said, you know, I've got to do this because this is like, you know, gnawing, gnawing at me. She she really didn't know what was bothering her. She felt stuck in her life. And as she spent time thinking about it, she said, you know, I really always wanted to be a mystery writer. So she started writing, she started taking courses, she went to master class, she went to conferences. She said it took her a few years, but she wrote a book, had 170 rejections. Oh boy. <laughs> but you know, sales executives are used to rejection, right? And she wrote a second book. Anyway, to make a long story short, she has just published her sixth book with a publisher. She is 66 years old and she says to herself, I am a mystery novelist and I'm a writer. 
And had she not really went back and said, what am I missing that I really wanted to do? She may not have picked up that thread. So that's one great example of how you can go back to your younger self and pull something forward and think about how you can do it in a contemporary way. So good I, I love that. I, I love that in particular because it's something that I've always thought about maybe doing someday, right? Trying to trying to write a, a mystery. I I um I read them pretty much uh -huh. nonstop. Um, but yeah. I think the whole so maybe she she sets out a path for me to uh, to follow. Are there yeah. other exercises that that you found to be helpful as we try to get ourselves um, to that next idea? Yeah, I th another a great fun sort of quiz game in, in the book is take five words that you use to describe yourself, not parent or spouse or your profession, but five words like, you know, generous and loyal and funny and traits, five traits. And then ask 10 people in your life, your family and your friends, your close ins to, to give you five words that how they would describe you. And the 10 people cannot talk to each other to confer. It all has to be, you know, one to one. Take those 50 words, map them out. And how do they match up? First of all, to your own self-identifiers, because we all know people who are a little out of touch with, with how the world sees them. You know, the person who says, I'm really empathetic. And you say, well, you're the least empathetic person I know. <laughs> you're know, really people, judgy. You don't know it, but you're really judgy. People. Right. But... Take those words. So a great example in the book is a woman named Patricia who did a form of this and everyone in her world around her said, you are so funny. You are the funniest person we know. She was an elementary school teacher in, um, in a small town outside of Atlanta. She was leaving her profession in her late 50s. She was sort of done with teaching, but she was curious about what she might do next. And she took um, the advice of someone and went to Atlanta to an open mic session in a comedy club. And she said she got on stage and she became a different person. And all of a sudden she said, well, maybe I am funny. And she hired a coach, a woman <laughs> who coaches female comics. And she said during the process, she kept saying, you know, I'm not funny enough. I'm not young enough. I'm not pretty enough. All the things. P.S. Today, Patricia Forehand is a stand-up comic that works the comedy circuit throughout the Southeast and the US. So she took that word funny and she mined it. So what is your word that you get back from all of your folks that you are important in your life? And how do you, you know, spend time thinking about how you take that word and turn it into something that can help you get unstuck? That's amazing. That that yeah. that is amazing. We have a question from um Joseph, he says, I'm a financial planner for women 45 plus. What are some great questions to ask my clients to help guide them into looking at life through this lens? First of all, Joseph, this is this is a great question. And it's it's particularly great, I think, for women. I've had so many conversations with women who have left the workforce for one reason or another who are just unsure of of where life is going to take them next or or what steps they should plot out yeah i think one of the things that that definitely happened with the 40 individuals that that i interviewed is that they each spent a good year or more really thinking through what they wanted for their lives. And not all of them changed everything at once um, because that would be a bit cataclysmic to do that. Although there was one woman who had the year of change. She did everything. She left her career. She left her husband. She, her kids were grown up. She sold the house. She did, she did it all. Um, I don't know if I'd recommend that, but you know, they spent, <laughs> each of them spent a good year thinking about what it was that they wanted to do as individuals. So I think a lot of people, you know, they kind of free float through their financial lives. They don't necessarily, first you've got to think about how you're going to have a sustained economic foundation if you're going to live to be 90. I mean, that's to me sort of, and a lot of people don't think that way. You know, a lot of people don't go beyond sort of the next five, 10 years. They don't, they don't think that they're going to live to be 90 necessarily, but 
you know, many financial planners and advisors, and maybe Joseph's this way, now map that out for you, that this is what your your income will look like. And the, the other piece of it is, what is it that you want to accomplish in the next phase of your life? I mean, do you want to go back to school? Do you want a new career? Do you want to go live and spend a year living around different parts of the world? I think you've got to really identify those and put the thoughts together and then the practical numbers against that. So I was talking to um, a woman who was in her 50s who wanted to go and, and, and live in three different places around the world for four months. And she wanted to we, eat, pray, love it. Exactly right. And she's trying to figure out how she was going to do it financially and she wasn't going to work. And so she, to, what she ended up doing is going through a variety of practical scenarios, one of which was she was able to rent her apartment for a year and then make some money on that. And then she was able to find in one of the places, a place where she could stay at no cost. And she started piecing together all the practical pieces to fulfill, fulfill that goal. But if she hadn't gone through the, the first part of what do I want to re really want to do, spend a year living abroad, she wouldn't have been able to put the practical pieces in, in place. And I'm kind of going through this with my sister right now and her husband who would love to move to Mexico to a town um, called Ahihi, which has a big expat community. And we're work and they're in their late 50s. And we're working through, well, what is this going to look like financially? How are you going to do it? Yeah. How are you going to, you know, so a lot of people don't, it's, it's hard work, but you have to do the work. You, uh, you work. talk, you talk about owning your numbers, right? And I yeah. think that's where, that's where a lot of this comes in. Um, you know, we're not so confident in the, um, the, the amount of saving that people are doing for retirement, but we're even less confident in their ability to take the money that they have saved in and make it last. And that's one of the reasons that on this show, we talk a lot about guaranteed lifetime income. We talk about taking whatever you've saved or at least some chunk of it and, and using tools like annuities to make sure that even if you go right past 90 and keep on going to 95 or to 100, you're going to be okay. Um, right. How how did the people in, in the book that you interviewed, how did they approach that challenge? You know, one of the things, some of them realized that they were going to have to work a long time because they didn't have pensions. They didn't have, um, some of them didn't have a 401k. Um, today, you may have read about the the news coming out of the Social Security Trust Fund. The, the inflator is going to be, I think, nine and a half percent. So a lot of retirees are going to get an incremental hit in their Social Security. But that's not necessarily going to be able to fund what it is that you uh, hope to do and how you hope to live. So I think what is emerging is a lot of people talking about how they want to participate in the gig economy how they want to participate in coming in and out of the workforce. Uh, the, the U.S. Department of Labor, their statistics say that in the next decade, the fastest growing group in the workforce are going to be 75 plus year olds. Wow. A 96% increase over the next decade. And Do I you think, think Michael, that, that those people are going to be working because they want to, or they're going to be working because they have to? I think more because they have to. Um, you know, we've got an interesting scenario in our country right now because we have, as you know, you're going to have the largest transfer of generational wealth in the history of the world over the next 20 years, 60, 70 trillion dollars worth of assets. So you've got an extraordinarily wealthy group of assets. But on the other side, we have a very challenged crisis situation with lower socioeconomic people. Um, you know, people of color, people who have not had advantages that don't have assets. And so how are we going to balance this out, especially as people are living longer? And in fact, if the, the already we know that in, you know, by 2030, one in five people will be over, will be over 50 and some of them over 65. And that's the, the fastest growing cohort. 
how are we going to sustain that? And so a part of that is going to be people are going to have to have different kind of work and mm -hmm. they are going to be working in different kinds of ways because they're going to have to for the people on the latter part of that of that group. And then what do we, what is the the former part of that group do to help that process? You know, that's a whole other other discussion. You you mentioned the topic of life layering earlier yeah. in this in this conversation and let me just um let me just tell everybody we've got a few minutes left with Michael. So if you have questions, please type them into the chat. Joseph Joseph wrote Michael that he really appreciated that answer. Thank you. So um so thank you for that as well. What what does life layering mean? I mean, I think layering, I think of putting a sweater on over my T-shirt. Right, right. So first of all, get rid of the bucket list. The bucket list are one off things. It's like eating an hors d'oeuvre. It doesn't really satisfy you. You know, life layering is, first of all, take your your identity of parent, partner and profession and put it on the side and start building personas around who you are as an individual and create a layer in your life that is long-term and sustained sustained initiative. Because think about something creative. You don't have to have a timestamp on creativity, right? You can always be a painter or a writer for your entire life. One of the things that when I was 39 years old, I had a great job. I was working, I was the publisher of GQ, as you know. Um, and I had a great family life, but I was all I was doing was working and identifying myself through what I did. And I always had an adventure gene in me. So I decided to take a flying lesson and to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa with a group of friends. And I became a pilot. And in my 40s, I said, my 40s are going to be my adventure years. But what happened is I ended up creating my adventure years since that moment to today. So in owning my age, I'm 68. So for 28 years, I have had this incredible layer of adventuring, climbing mountains, chasing lemurs in, in Madagascar, running seven marathons on seven continents, including Antarctica. Um, you know a lot of the stories. Um, and that layer has really been a rich way for me to have a unique kind of life. And so build your layers around something that you're really passionate about and what happens is when you do step out of that first career, or if you are in that second half of your life where you have a bit more time, you have a lot of different personas that you've created for yourself. And you're not hung up on, we all know the person who steps out of their seat and they go off the cliff because they, they were identifying themselves by what they do as opposed to who they are. So life layering is a great <laughs> approach. I think it's so, so smart. And I'm, I'm thinking of my mother who is 82 years old. In the last year, um, we've lost my stepfather and she is, um, she has been an artist her whole life, but she is spending more time on her art. She's, she's taking more classes. She's exploring watercolors, which is a medium that she's never explored before. And it's really, it's, it's providing her with not just things to do that she enjoys, but people to do them with that she right. enjoys. And that, that's an important element too. That's, that's your second R. Right. Exactly right. That's exactly right. The, the second R is really finding those people who support you in your change. If you want to make a, a one of my next uh, stories that's going to be an Esquire is um, how you can change careers at 50 plus. Now, if you walk into your household and you tell your wife or your husband or your partner, I want to change careers, you know, at 55 years old, they're sort of like, what? <laughs> you know, right. some, some people are like, great, let's do it. Other people are like, are you crazy? You know, we need the money. You can't, you're on a track, et cetera. But once you think it through and decide what you want to do, a great story in the book is a guy who was a Wall Streeter, MBA, you know, from NYU, made a lot of money on Wall Street. And in his late forties, he was miserable. And he really went back to his younger self. And he said, I'd always wanted to be a teacher. Um, and he went and got a degree in adolescent education and he teaches math in the inner city schools of the New York City public school system. And he's completely ecstatic about this career change. But his wife, who is a working, a working mother, 
Um, obviously, they jointly decided that he was going to be able to do this. Obviously, he's not making as much money as he did on Wall Street as a teacher, but they figured it out. And so whether it's your, your partner, your family, your kids, your community, your posse, you know, find the people who are going to really be supportive of the change that you want to make and let them be the sort of proverbial wing, uh, wind beneath your wing, so to speak. There, there is, um, there's a bit of a push and pull going on between um, uh, trying to accumulate assets and, 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 and pass them along, I think, and, and using um, those assets during your life. Uh, in, in preparation for this conversation, Michael and I had a conversation where we, we talked about two different books. Um, one was The Number, which was written many years ago by Lee Eisenberg, a former editor of Esquire. The other was um, Die Broke, uh, which was written many years ago by Stephen Pollan, although there's a new book called Die with Zero, which is, is very much the same idea. How are you experiencing this, um, this, this sort of tension between accumulating money and making sure that you just are holding tightly to it and and this idea that that we should really use it all up while we're alive yeah there's definitely a bifurcation that's that's happening in in, in our country first of all as a, as a culture and a society we do have we are seeing we do seem to be wired that we want to acquire as much as we possibly can and then really focus on leaving as much as we possibly can to our children and I would argue that that's a little misguided. You know, I would argue that do what you want to do with your children while you're alive so that they can experience travel or certainly you're going to pay for their education or buy them a house or do whatever you want uh, to be able to help them. And don't be so obsessed with, with what you're going to leave them per se. And I think there's a whole school of thought that's emerging with people. And I've heard people say, my wife and I, my husband and I, we've decided that we're not leaving anything to our children. You know, we're going to spend the money on what we want to do, which is great. I just met a couple in their 80s who just built their dream house, which I love. Um, and we're going to do the kinds of things that we want to do, you know, in our lives. And, you know, our kids will find their way and we'll help them along the way. But, you know, we want to they didn't use the words die broke, but basically that was their that was their message. And I think there's a very, a very big part of that that's happening, especially with people who have the good fortune of having had many assets. And as you know, Jane, there are many ways that you can also move assets through CGAs and CRTs and all kinds of mechanisms um, for pushing assets out further and or giving to charities and nonprofits. And so there are lots of different ways you can spend your money. It doesn't have to be on you know, luxury goods per se. It can also be in helping uh, your communities and helping in the nonprofit world. Yeah, I, I liked your description of boomers as being the original activists and, yeah. and this idea that, that maybe we should be using some of our money, um, not just to make sure that we have enough to go the distance, which of course is uh, important, right? We, we right. want to make sure that if we've worked this long and this hard, we set ourselves up to know that when we take whatever we have coming in and combine it with social security, we can live comfortably for as long as we live. And, and guaranteed income plays a, it plays a big role there. But then taking what's left, taking a, a decent chunk of what's left and, and using it to create the world as you want to see it. Yes. I mean, we were, the boomers were the original activists. I mean, they embraced Earth Day. We did Peace Corps. We marched against the Vietnam War. We, we were on the front lines of civil rights and women's rights. And we, they were the, the, the boomers were the original activists. And reclaiming some of that that DNA, I think, especially since the boomers have accumulated so much wealth and put it to work in impact in terms of whatever it is that you're passionate about, environment, social justice, education, you know, there's a huge amount of possibilities that people can have. And certainly the, the next generation, the millennials, this master's degree I got happened to be a nonprofit philanthropy. So I know a little bit about this. The millennials definitely want impact in terms of putting the money to use now 
like getting the money out the door. And so there's a big trend happening in the philanthropy world. Spend the money now. Don't create family foundations. Don't create things in perpetuity. Have the impact now and make it a family experience so that you're bringing your children and or your grandchildren into the discussion. But there are so many assets that have been accumulated that we need to go back to our activist roots. That's what I would say. I, I, I love that concept. I'm gonna, gonna try to do that myself. The book is called Roar Into the Second Half of Life. Michael, where can we find out more about you and all the wonderful things that you're doing? Yeah, thank you. The book is uh, in print on Kindle and Audible. Um, RoarbyMichaelClinton.com. We have a monthly newsletter now with a lot of fresh voices around the new longevity and great perspective. The, we have two, every month we, we showcase reimagineers, people who are actually have changed the script and living a different kind of second half. So I would invite everyone to sign up for it, enjoy it. It's a freebie and it keeps the conversation going. So thanks, thanks for letting me uh, talk about that. Absolutely. And if you're looking for more information, you can also check out our website at protectedincome.org. More information on this conversation specifically is available at protectedincome.org slash Clinton. Michael, always a pleasure to see you. Um, we got to do it in person soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Jane. Great to see you. See you again Bye. soon. Bye, everybody. See you next time.